ready for heaven? If you knew that Jesus was returning next week, next month, or even next year, what changes would you make in your life, and more importantly, in your heart? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, takes us to Isaiah chapters 4 and 5, where we explore the answers to these difficult questions and more. So while you prepare for our study, let's also join hearts with our world prayer team as we support followers of Jesus Christ in the Middle East and North Africa who listen to Through the Bible in their heart languages, like this friend from Iraq. I'm so happy. My joy comes from God's Word and the fact that through your program I can know Him better and comprehend the Bible as I move with you step by step, each day, each chapter, each book. I learn more and am amazed. Thank you so much. Next, we hear from a listener who's too afraid to tell us where he's writing from, but here's what he had to say. I believe in Jesus, just like any other prophet. Is this not what Christians believe? I recently started listening to your Bible studies, and I'm not sure I understand. What you say seems different, and I'm curious. My family tells me not to listen, that you speak lies. However, they cannot dissuade me. I would like to know about your Bible and what you think about Jesus. I will be listening intently from now on. Wow. World Prayer Team, did you hear that? Pray for this young man. The Lord knows that specific situation. Pray that he surrenders his heart to God today. And together, let's rejoice in this next letter we got from Sudan. Dear brothers and sisters, may God use you always in reaching more people to his kingdom. I listen regularly to your radio program. It changed my life by introducing me to my Savior. Now you help me in my spiritual growth. I'm continually surprised at how understanding the Bible helps me to deal with the daily problems I face. My family says I am a better man, a patient and kind man because of it. God bless you all for this labor in his name. And then our last note comes from a woman who didn't actually tell us her location either, but it's somewhere that following Jesus is rare and dangerous. As a teenager, I happened to find a local radio station that was talking about God. I was eager to know more, and I kept listening every day. I'm now in my mid-twenties and married. I'm grateful that your programs have made me a new person. No one else except my husband knows that I am a Christian. He could beat me or abandon me for my faith, so I thank the Lord he is a loving and tolerant man. I give thanks to the Lord for everything that he has provided for us. I would like to read the Holy Bible. I cannot find it here in my country. I know I will sometimes need your help to understand what I'll be reading, but I believe I can depend on your programs. Thank you for making me want to know more about Jesus and about his book. Well, if you haven't already joined our world prayer team, why don't you hop aboard as we travel on our knees asking God to reach these listeners and his whole world with his whole word. To sign up, visit ttb.org forward slash pray. Now, as we pray together, let's ask God to bless his word in the Middle East and North Africa and then bring peace and joy to those listening. Heavenly Father, it is such a joy and privilege to gather around your word today. We're thankful we can do it freely here. Thank you for the blessing that this teaching brings to our lives and the lives of millions of others around the world. We specifically lift up our brothers and sisters living in the Middle East, Lord, and in Africa. For many, choosing to follow you is so dangerous. We ask that you would protect them and encourage them and then use them to bring others to a saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. In his wonderful name we pray, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we're in this section of Isaiah, and today we put in at chapter 4. That is one complete prophecy, beginning with Isaiah 2 and going through Isaiah 5. And here you have a synopsis, actually, of the entire book of Isaiah in these chapters here, because he touches all the bases that he'll be touching on in the rest here. Now, as we come to chapter 4, again, may I repeat, it's a continuation of the prophecy that was begun in chapter 2. And the conditions that are set before us here were the conditions that prevailed at the time of the Babylonian captivity, and also they will be the conditions during the Great Tribulation period right before the setting up of the kingdom. This is a very brief chapter. It's only six verses, one of the briefest in the book. And it is descriptive of conditions which did prevail at the time of the Babylonian captivity. Now, the structure of this chapter is very simple. The first verse is the only one that depicts conditions during 
the time of the great tribulation period, the last days. And the remainder of the chapter sets before the reader the preparation that will be necessary for entering the kingdom. And this section, of course, is entirely anticipatory. Now we have, therefore, in the first verse here, we have conditions prevailing because of the frightful casualties of war. And that will be those conditions in the time of the Great Tribulation, and it's been true in all wars also. I'm reading verse 1, "...and in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel." Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. In other words, because the population, the manpower population, has been decimated by war, there will be a surplus of women. And it will be to such an extent that seven women will be willing to share one man in that day. And they'll all of them be willing to hold down a job. I suppose a man will do nothing in the world but just keep books for the rest of them and make sure that they, you know, turn in their proper share. But it reveals the awful conditions that will prevail. And it's a situation that, to a certain extent, prevails today. It was true after World War II in a very special way for a while. And it's true today. I understand there's something like a surplus now of 80,000 women. When I heard that the other day on radio, I told my wife she better be very careful and take care of me a little bit more, you know, with a little more concern because I told her there just weren't enough men to go around. Well, that brings me now to verse 2 through 6, and these are conditions preparatory to establishing the kingdom. And verse 2, "...in that day..." shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And you'll notice that we have a reference here to in that day. In verse 1, it was in that day. And now in verse 2, in that day. Now that will occur again and again in Isaiah and in all of the prophets. And it'll be mentioned in the New Testament. The day of the Lord. Joel will have something to say about it. It begins, as every Hebrew day always began, at sundown. It begins with darkness, and it moves from darkness to the dawn. And it begins with the great tribulation period and goes on into the millennial kingdom. So that we have here a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the branch. Now, this word, the branch, here, there are actually 18 Hebrew words that are translated by the one English word, the branch. All of them refer to the Lord Jesus. Here it means it's just a sprout. Now, I'll be speaking of this in a great deal of detail when we get over to the 11th chapter of this book. And I'll pass by it now, but the Lord Jesus Christ is the branch. He is here the sprout. He's a branch out of a dry ground, we're going to be told later on. Here is something green that's sprung up in the desert. We'll talk about that later, but the reference is definitely to him. Now in verse 3, it shall come to pass that he that is left to Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy even everyone that's written among the living in Jerusalem. In other words, God's people, both Israel and the Gentiles, during the Great Tribulation, will survive that period. The Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear. He expressed it in a way that actually has always seemed strange, but he's looking at it, of course, at the end of the Great Tribulation period, and he says, "...he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved." Well, they were sealed at the beginning of the tribulation to make sure they got through. And the shepherd is able to keep his own, his sheep. And therefore, they're going to endure unto the end. That's what he's saying here. You have that same thought, of course, when you get over to the book of Revelation. 
They are the ones, that great company that was sealed at the beginning of the great tribulation. They come through, and they come through that period. Now, in verse 4, "...when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning." You see, God's people must be prepared to enter the kingdom. That brings up a very pertinent question, does it not, for you and me today? Are you fit today for heaven? Right now, suppose God took you to heaven as you are right now. Would you be fit for heaven? I can't answer it for you, but there's going to have to be a great deal of repair work done on Vernon McGee to make him ready for heaven. And that is what life is all about. It's just a school preparing you for eternity. A great many people think this is all, and they're making a very sad mistake. Preparation is being made here for eternity. And the question is, and it's something for you to think about, maybe in your odd moments or when you're lying on your bed at night, are you fit for heaven? Suppose God took you to heaven as you are right now. Would you be a square peg in a round hole? I'm afraid that I would, and that's the wonderful thing. Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. He's going to have to make some changes. Verse 5, And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, upon her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. Now the glory of God will be upon every house in the kingdom, not just on the temple. What a glorious thing it'll be. Verse 6, And there shall be a tabernacle for a shed in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and a covert from the storm and from rain. In other words, security will come to the nation Israel in that day. And they today do not have peace. Therefore, this prophecy is not being fulfilled. They're not back in the land in fulfillment of prophecy when they are Every man will dwell under his vine and his fig tree in peace. And notice here the order. Peace always follows grace and mercy and cleansing. You can't have peace in the world. And as we've said before, the problem has never been in a political party and the problem has never been way over yonder in a foreign country. The problem is in the human heart today. We war because it's in our hearts. Man is a warlike creature today because he's a sinner. And he won't deal with that question. And when you deal with that question, you can then deal with the question of wars. When you settle one, we're going right into another. We've always done it, and we haven't changed. Now, when we come to chapter 5, the last in this series of one prophecy from chapter 2 to 5, You have the song of the vineyard and the six woes that follow. Now, this is a very wonderful section, by the way. The song of the vineyard is in the first seven verses, and then from 8 through 30, you have the six woes. And I want to read this part right here, chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. I'm told, and I have tempted to read it in Hebrew, But I can't read Hebrew very accurately and certainly giving it its effect. But they tell me that this is without doubt one of the most beautiful songs that's ever been written, that there's nothing actually quite like it. You have nothing to compare it to. It's a musical symphony, and it is absolutely impossible to reproduce it in English. It's truly a psalm. Will you listen Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Now, there's nothing wrong with the soil, therefore. The problem is with the vineyard itself, that is, with the vine. Now, notice what he did. This vineyard, I think we need to determine right here and now what we're talking about. The vineyard is Israel. It's Judah. It is this people. It's not the church or something else. You don't have to guess at this. Verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts 
is the house of Israel, and the man of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. And that, of course, cry was a cry of persecution. Now, notice what he's saying, and again, he's asking you to consider. Come into court and listen to it. And listen to him. And the minute that you listen to him and see his charge against the nation Israel, my friend, you'll find yourself condemned. It couldn't be otherwise. Will you listen? Verse 2, And he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked, and it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. Now he asks these people to judge. And very candidly, friend, when you look at your own life in that, are you ready to complain against God today? I know how I whined and howled when I got cancer. I felt like the Lord just was being unfair. Then I had the opportunity of lying alone on that hospital bed and looking at my own life. Friends, God wasn't wrong. (laughs) I was. I tell you, you and I need to face up to it. This idea today that we're something special. God's not going to do anything that's unjust. He's not going to do anything that's wrong. You and I are wrong. God is not wrong. Listen to him. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I'll tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I'll take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down." You see, when God put them in the land there for 500 years, he put a wall around them and did not let anybody touch them, though many times he could have judged them. Then God says now in this, you're my vineyard, I'd hedged you in, but now I'm breaking down the wall. And Assyria came in, first Syria, then Assyria, then Babylon, then Egypt. They all poured in and they laid the land waste. And that land in spite of everything that's being done over there today, to me is a pretty desolate-looking place. God has judged it. Now he says, I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. And the form and latter rains for over a thousand years did not fall in that land. That's the reason it's so desolate today. And the former rains, I understand, have begun, but not the latter. Now, will you notice in verse 7 again, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the man of Judah his pleasant plant. I hope we won't make any mistake now. We don't have to guess who he's talking about. The vineyard is Israel. And that's one of the figures as the fig tree is of this nation. And he looked for judgment, but they hold oppression for righteousness, but behold a cry. Now, again, God is going to spell it all out. There are six woes that are mentioned here, and each one of these tell of a certain sin. And these are things that God is judging them for. And if you want to put these down on your life or the life of our nation, you can do it. But the interpretation is for Israel. It's already been fulfilled in their connection anyway. But It's something that we can make application to our own hearts and lives. Now, will you notice this? Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Now, this is the first sin of Israel. And what is this? Well, this sin is the lust of the eye. And more specifically, it's covetousness. And covetousness, we're told today, is idolatry. That is, this is the big business here that's expanding at the expense of the little man. That's what happened in Israel. 
so that the little man was squeezed out. And all of this was done that great fortunes might be accumulated. Now, God will judge a people on that. The only excuse for such expansion is the insatiable greed for more property and possessions. That is the story that you have here. And again, may I say, it is a sad story. Now he says in verse 9 here, "...in mine ears saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an ephah." Now what he's saying is simply this, that though they expand their lands, the yield will not be great because apparently a famine, then God will send famine as a judgment. It'll decimate the crop yield so that the extended holdings will not produce a bumper crop at all. And I was very much interested in reading an article the other day that this earth that you and I live on is running short of energy. We're running out of gasoline. We are running out of arable land today. And this matter of ecology is a real thing right now, by the way, because we're seeing that pollution is destroying so much of this earth. My friends, we're going to be on a desolate planet one of these days. What's happening? God's judging this earth that we're on. We're running out of energy. Going to be out of gasoline one of these days. So if you're planning on a trip, you better take it now because there's going to be a shortage. Oh, I don't mean in our lifetime, but there are those that believe it will be in our lifetime. But the earth is running out of energy, and this is a judgment God made upon his nation in that. Now, the second woe is, "'Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night to wine and flame them the harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe and wine. That is, they go to the rock festivals and take their drugs and liquor along and their beer. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Drunkenness and pleasure on a national scale are the sins that are mentioned here. And it leads to the deadening of all spiritual perception. I want to speak on that a little more definitely next time because our time is up till next time. May God richly bless you, my beloved. As Dr. McGee said, God is clearly speaking to Israel in this prophecy, but there's also a message for us today. For a greater understanding of this teaching, we offer a bunch of different materials to deepen your personal study of God's Word in the subject of prophecy. If you want to browse our online library of Bible study materials, just visit us at ttb.org forward slash resources. Or if we can help you find something specific, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now, as we approach Resurrection Sunday, a booklet that might be of interest to you as you prepare your heart and mind for this significant celebration of our faith is our booklet by Dr. McGee titled, The Radical Cost of the Cross, What Jesus Really Paid for Your Salvation. To download your free copy, visit ttb.org forward slash booklets. And while you're visiting us at ttb.org, I sure hope that you'll think about those you'd like to share God's Word with yourself. Thanks to a partnership with our friends over at Faith Comes By Hearing, it's easy to share God's Word with people whose heart language is something other than English. In fact, you'll find the Bible in more than 1,800 languages. I'm not exaggerating. More than 1,800 languages. You can just visit the resources section of ttb.org and click on the link Bible in Your Language. There you'll find text and audio versions of the Bible available in French, German, Arabic, Korean. The list goes on and on. Other languages that will reach listeners like this one we prayed for today in the Middle East and North Africa. Again, God's Word is available in more than 1,800 languages in all. So I certainly hope that you'll be praying and dreaming about who you'll share God's Word with today. Again, to access it online or to download the Bible.is app, visit ttb.org forward slash resources. Click on the Bible in Your Language link. Well, tomorrow, our five-year journey through God's Word continues in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 8 to 24. Why don't we all commit to reading through these passages a few times to prepare for our study? 
Until then, I'm Steve Schweitz. For all of us here at Through the Bible, we're praying that God fills you with his grace, mercy, and peace as you walk with him today. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.